Gosford in East Lothian, the home of the 12th Earl of Weems. When he returned after the Second World War, he found his ancestral seat almost in ruins. Oh, gracious. Well, this was the kitchen with a, an opaque glass roof and family rooms on the uh, first and second story around it. Like many of the great houses of Britain during the war, Gosford had been an army base, with soldiers living in the house and tanks on the lawn. Military occupation often led to extensive damage. At Gosford, an army electrician had accidentally set fire to the ballroom, and four-fifths of the vast mansion was now uninhabitable. Like all great country houses, the grandeur of Gosford had been an expression of aristocratic power. Now, the family was reduced to living in the south wing. The aristocracy had reached an all-time low. In the 1945 election, Labour vigorously attacked privilege and the uneven distribution of wealth. Now a new parliament must be elected. The choice is between that same Conservative Party, which stands for private enterprise, private profit and private interests, and the Labour Party, which demands that in peace as in war, the interests of the whole people should come before those of a section. There don't seem to be any pigeons living in them now. Were they full? Hmm? Were they full of pigeons at one point? Oh, they had had pigeons in them, mm -hmm. but not now. At the Labour Party conference, Dennis Healy expressed the class-conscious sentiments of many servicemen. The upper classes in every country, he said, are selfish, depraved, dissolute and decadent. What we must do is talk about the decorations that we're going to have for the party on the 21st. Well, what is that party? I mean, who's coming to it? Gosford still has the marble hall and the 25 rooms leading off it. No, but... When Lord Weems grew up here before the war, this staircase led to rooms lined in white silk, hung with the portraits of Stuart kings. There were bathrooms made of marble and a whole corridor of bedrooms for bachelor guests. His second wife didn't know the house when it stood intact. Now most of it is a confusing jumble of ruins. I'm afraid I can't find the room just now. Well, there isn't one. No, but I, I did... I telling you. No, all right. There is no room we, here. We can look in beyond the big dining Unless room. Unless you go through the window and into that room. All right. Mm -hmm. Are these really bird ne bird's nests? It wasn't only military carelessness that caused the damage, but also dry rot and faulty mortar. After the war, building materials were scarce, and you had to have a licence to make repairs to private houses. The licences were few and far between. Quite a dangerous place there. You might walk over and get killed. The real threat, though, was the idea that these buildings represented a way of life which had gone for good. They need dozens of servants to run them, and hardly anyone wanted to be a servant anymore. So at Gosford, as elsewhere, they simply gave up and took the roof off. The north wing was left open to the elements. The 1945 election was a landslide victory for Labour. At the polling booth, the people of Great Britain voted for the welfare state and nationalisation of coal, paid for by taxing the rich. In socialist Britain, the interests of the landed aristocracy seemed utterly irrelevant. Hugh Edward Conway Seymour, 8th Marquess of Harford, Earl of Yarmouth, Viscount Beecham, Lord Conway, Baron Conway of Ragley and Baron Conway of Kilalta, grew up at Ragley in Worcestershire. He was nine years old when he inherited the numerous titles, the estate and the house. I've always thought my mother was... A little bit casual. No, she didn't tell me. Uh, I, I was lying in bed um, with some nasal problem of, of some sort at my prep school, Luglev, uh, and um, reading, I think it was a daily sketch, uh, I saw a tiny headline saying boy of nine, and because I was nine years old myself, I looked to see what boy of nine had done. To my complete astonishment, I read that Hugh Edward Conway Seymour had become the eighth Marquess of Harford on the death of his uncle. 
And I thought, I really did wonder for a moment if there could be some other little boy of nine also called Hugh Obercombe Seaman. And then I thought, no, the, 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 that, can't, that can't be. Uh, but I didn't even know I had an uncle called Lord Harford. Because the new Lord Harford was only a child, trustees were appointed to run Ragley on his behalf. During the war, they made the house available to the Red Cross as a hospital for wounded soldiers. It only made Ragley all the more exciting for the young Lord Harford. Oh, it's wonderful. It's, it's a wonderful house for children. And of course, <clears throat> during the war, when the house was a hospital, although this film was rather out of bounds because it, it, was, it had 50 beds in it, I always had partners for tennis because it was a convalescent hospital and so there were always a few patients uh, who were ready, able and willing to play tennis with me. In 1946 the hospital closed and the Red Cross said goodbye to Ragley, leaving the house back in the care of the family. Uh, the Red Cross had paid for the central heating and my mother then decided we couldn't afford the central heating. I don't know if we really couldn't or not. But the winter of 1947 was bitterly cold and we had no heating at all. We just had rather small log fires. When Lord Harford was 17, his mother and the trustees decided that it was no longer practical to live at Ragley and that the family should move out. My mother moved to a farmhouse, oh, only about a mile from here. Um, a farmhouse on the estate, you know. I did hate it. Horace Walpole, for instance, who fits quite nicely over the fireplace there, in, in the farmhouse dining room, he was floor to ceiling <laughs> and looked ridiculous as a result. Um, and so much of our furniture is quite big, and it, it, no, I, I never felt comfortable there. I really hated it, but all, it was more than that. It was, of course, an admission of defeat as far as I was concerned. Um, and I was absolutely determined to move back into this house as soon as possible. The trustees stayed in control of the house and estate until Lord Harford was 21. They believed the family would never live at Ragley again, and they allowed the house to slide into disrepair. Then they decided that Ragley Hall should be demolished. It was an appalling idea, and I really was horrified. Uh, so I did what I'd been told was the rudest thing you could possibly do. I sent all my trustees postcards in pencil, saying, I hope the subject of the demolition of Ragley will never again be mentioned. Hugh Harford had prevented his trustees from demolishing Ragley, but he still had to find a way to keep the building standing. It was a problem faced by aristocrats across the country. In the introduction to Brideshead Revisited, Evelyn Waugh warned that the ancestral seats of Britain were doomed to decay and spoliation like the monasteries in the 16th century. But when some aristocrats started demolishing their ancestral seats because they could no longer afford to keep them up, the National Trust became concerned and launched a scheme to help preserve them. Unless something is done to preserve these beautiful old country houses and gardens, in a generation, half of them will be in ruins through taxation and death duties. James Lees Milne had the job of visiting and assessing the threatened mansions for the National Trust. When the Trust took on a house, it wanted the family to continue to live there. I have been accused lately uh, of fostering the interests of the landed gentry at the expense of the, the poor public. Well, of course, that's absolute piffle. We didn't think that at all. But we knew that unless we were nice to the owners, in other words, could give them some assurance that they could go on living in the houses or part of the houses, we wouldn't get them at all. James Lees Milne kept a diary of his experiences, including a visit by bicycle to Lord and Lady Berwick, at Attingham Hall. I turned smartly left under an imposing archway off the main Wellington Road. But when the great house hove into sight, a moment of apprehension assailed me. Would Lord and Lady Berwick be very formidable? What would they think of an official from London arriving on a two-wheeler? Lord and Lady Berwick were surprisingly unreserved in explaining that in spite of a large estate, the house was a cruel burden to them. But it had to be preserved at all costs, however onerous 
and the marvellous contents kept intact. They were very hard up, and, uh, and the place was in a pretty bad way. They were rather desperate, I think. And, I, and the trust help, was a help to them. But the trust could not help every impoverished aristocrat who turned to them. The Earl of Stradbrook failed to persuade them to help him with Henham Hall in Suffolk. The trust could only take on properties which came with a substantial endowment and were of real architectural importance. Very often I would go, sometimes long journey, to Northumberland or outer part of the country, furthest parts, and, and, and even have to stay a night or two to discuss the future of this house. And I might see going up the drive that it clearly wasn't a very important house. So I had to pretend. And I never would say to them, I'm afraid this house is no good. I never did that, even if they asked me. Tuesday, 9th of July, 1946. Reached Wolseley Hall at three. This place, the property of Sir Edric Wolseley, has belonged to his family since the conquest. House has a very fine Charles II staircase, but is much altered since first erected. In all other respects, the house is a poor specimen. Grounds and park likewise indifferent. Whole place disintegrating. Sir Edric's grandson, Sir Charles Wolseley, now walks his dog where Wolseley Hall once stood. Uh, the National Trust weren't in the least interested. James Lee's.